Book Stew viewers and listeners. The person I have with me today, if you've been a big Book Stew fan for uh, all 10 years of the show, um, will look very familiar to you. His name is Lamar Giles, and Lamar has joined me on December 2015, March 2016, May 2017, December 2018, February 2020, October 2022, and now December 2023. Lamar, welcome back. I kind of have a permanent slot in the schedule for you, which I'm so happy that um, you come on the show to fill every, every year or so. Well, thank you for having me back, Eileen. It is a pleasure. So um, what I have front of, in front of me is your output partially, actually, for 2023. This has been an amazingly productive year for you. Um, so um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about each of these books in front of me and then about some um, upcoming possible really exciting good news. So um, let's start with this book, which actually I was very happy to see that the Epic Ellisons are girls. Um, before in your books, it's mostly been from a boy's point of view and the legendary Austin boys um, is a series that had, I think, three books in it. And now there are two girls who are in a brand new series. Um, they, I think they all live in the same town, but can you tell us a little bit about them? Sure, so the Epic Ellisons were in every legendary Austin Boys books. They were sort of background characters. They were the rivals to the heroes in those books, Otto and She. And from the beginning, I constructed the Epic Ellisons, Wiki and Lean, to be a team that can do the same thing that Otto and she do, but a little bit better, which always irritates Otto in the legendary Austin Boys <laughs> books. And because they're better at it, I always had it in my mind that they would eventually have their own adventure and they would leave their county for their adventure because the better team needs bigger adventures. And that's what's happening in Cosmos Camp. So um, this has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that you became the father of a daughter a few years ago. I, mean, I guess it's somewhat related. I'd had this plan in mind long before my daughter came along, but I was very happy to get further into the adventures of these characters, knowing that my little girl could read them one day. So um, what do you think, or are you hoping this will be also a series of three? I would like it to be, but it's an interesting situation where publishers kind of absorb other publishers. There are mergers, there are changes in staff. And the Epic Ellison's happens to be a book that was caught up in one of those publishing business situations. So it's sort of up in the air. Um, you, you gave me a compliment about my output this year where, yes, a lot of things have come out. But the truth is, many of these things were done way before this year. They're just making their premiere because of publishing, stalling things, business things. The Epic Ellison's is also the, the sort of victim of that sort of delay. So how, how many years ago did you actually finish it? Um, I probably finished Epic Ellison's in 2021. Oh, wow. At least it was okay. close. At least a, a good draft was done. You still had to do all the editing stuff. But like I said, I mean, just the business side of it, mergers and things have delayed the release of some things. And what, what do you think is the ideal uh, age or grade level for the Epic Ellison's? Well, I think third grade and up. Anybody who's reading at a third grade level could have fun with the Epic Ellison's, I believe. Well, this copy I bought for my nephew, so uh, we'll have to see if they enjoy it as much as the legendary Austin Boys, which they've already uh, read. Now on to the next one. So when I saw somewhere that you, that you were one of a troop of writers that were writing a book called House Party, of course, I immediately flashed on the movie, which I <laughs> loved. And I'm like, oh, this is weird that they would do a graphic novel of the movie, but it kind of, sounds kind of cool. And it turns out it's completely not a graphic novel of the movie. It's a completely different set of characters. And this is uh, for, I think, adults and high school kids. This hits like a kind of a sweet spot for graphic novels. So why don't you tell us about how this came about since there are 10 writers involved? So this was the brainchild of Justin A. Reynolds, uh, who's a fantastic writer, and he had this idea of getting a bunch of writers together to tell the story of a single party on a single night 
from several different perspectives. And everybody got to pick a sort of teen archetype to write to. Mine is Oscar Graham, AKA Intellect, who is a wannabe rapper. And the thing about Oscar is he's not good at rapping. Um, <laughs> everyone knows it except him. And so that's the, the gist of his arc through the party. But throughout the party, he meets several other people from his high school. His girlfriend's there, several friends are there. And it's really uh, several different stories told in together in a way that kind of creates this really rich tapestry of a night before all these characters would go their separate ways forever. I, I, um, I'm almost at the end. You can see my little marker in there. And I just want to share uh, with books do viewers and listeners what an archetype is these days. So we've got um, a class clown, an influencer, a jock, a popular girl, the school paper editor who, as it said, knows all the tea, an actor, a cool mom, which was a very, very funny kind of character to interject in there. She, her name was Carla, and she just kept saying, don't call me Karen. I'm not, I'm not Karen. Then there's your, your wannabe rapper, Oscar, that you wrote for, an artist named Comic Strip, and we all know who this artist is. You can talk a little bit about Jerry. And an emo band kid, which was, that was kind of hilarious, and a new girl. So some of those are people I would have met in high school uh, over 50 years ago, but a lot of them aren't. And I think there's a very strong strain of the influence of social media throughout the book um, that was very important to have in there because people are at the party and a lot of the book is them texting each other <laughs> while they're at the party. Yeah, I feel like that's a bit of realism, right? Like um, if I'm an old guy now, so it's not like I get to be around a lot of teens, but I have nephews, I have cousins, and when we have family get-togethers, it's very clear that the younger people are off in the corners on their phones texting whoever it is they really want to be talking to at the moment. So I think you kind of got to include that in anything contemporary. But so it's funny how to me. Did, how did, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how sure. did you all collaborate? Because you're all writing different characters. The party has to have a beginning and a middle and an end. So um, everybody gets like sections, like most of the characters have at least like three or four sections and the action moves back and forth between the characters that you're all writing, but yet they all have to kind of, they all have to hang out together and be together. I'm curious about that process. Well, I think a couple of things help that. The main thing being Justin, He's the mastermind and Bria Reagan, who is the editor in house that sort of kept track of everything. But very early on, we all had like zone meetings, like me and you were talking right now to kind of talk about the sort of arc we wanted to do, how it might intersect with someone else's arc. We got the party broken down into like hourly chunks. And so, and, and Justin <laughs> from the very beginning had like a map and he's like, so at this hour, your character's here. At this hour, this character's here. They cross paths here. So I, I don't know how he kept all that together, but it really was helpful to us to be able to have the freedom to write our story and have him tell us like, hey, this is where you need to intersect with so-and-so, and this is where this event is going to happen. Um, so I think that's like good team management from a good coach. Did you all, um, I mean, I would have, I would hope that after the book, you know, was was finished with edits and getting ready to come out. I, I hope you guys like had a big party because if you look at the, at the cover, there's, um, it's, you know, it's a graphic novel, but it's still mostly words, but there are some illustrations at the beginning that are so key. Um, so the, the, uh, the premise is that DeAndre, who's um, a very popular senior is having a big bash at his very, very, very parents, very, very nice house. And he's bringing together, you know, he's invited everybody and people are nervous about going, they're happy about going. Um, but, you know, there's just, um, it, well, first of all, it's hilarious to watch these people interact and avoid each other. And then there's the kidnapping of the rival high school's uh, mascot goat, which added a lot to it and a pizza stealing dog. And so um, 
did you all get together even on Zoom after it was done and like and have a good a good like Zoom party or anything? So the sad news is we never really got everybody together at one time just because schedules being what they are and there's so many people and also this was largely composed during COVID times. So never got everybody together. I think at the most we might have had six of the contributors on a Zoom at one time. But when the book came out, you know, we got a group text. There's always a group text. So that was going pretty hot and heavy when we finished copy edits, when we first saw the cover, when the book came out and we all still keep in touch. So maybe the stars will align and allow us to hang out in person together one day. I, I think this would be um, such a great either series or movie. Um, but um, do kids now, I don't think kids now really remember the original movie, House Party? Uh, you know, I've, ha I've asked this question on school visits because, you know, there's there's a version that just came out. Um, I guess even, I guess it was this year, House Party 2023, the one produced by LeBron James. And by having some access to that movie, I, I, first of all, I'm surprised how many kids do know the old movie. Um, streaming has made access to those sort of things possible. But with the new movie coming out, it's one of those things where it was on HBO Max, it says it's connected to the original movie that was available at the same time. So I think more people know it than we would expect. That's good because I, I you know, when I have to explain House Party to people like who were too young, it's mm -hmm. very distressing because it was, you know, it was such, I just thought I've seen it like four or five times because it's just so much fun. And uh, it's one of my favorites. I hate having to explain it to people because it's just like, let it roll. So I think this, did he, de was the, did he deliberately choose House Party as a way of kind of tying it to the original? You know, I'm unclear. And I didn't want to ask the question early on because I'm like, I, I don't want to be like the guy that's like, I'm like, can we use that title? Like, that's what I'm thinking oh. in my head, <laughs> you know? And I didn't want to be the guy that's like second guessing the coach, you know? So I'm really unclear of how Justin landed on House Party. And, but apparently, like I said, it wasn't an issue to use the title. And it, in some ways, I guess it's, it's timely and helpful because the new movie was coming out around the same time that the book was coming out. So maybe some people got some crossover connection there. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know why he settled on that, but it's fun. How did he choose or did you choose who would get, which character you would get? Well, he, I think he largely had the archetypes mapped out. But when he approached me and gave me the list, I was like, hey, I, I want to do something that's not on the list, and you let me know if it's okay. Because I was thinking of the original movie, particularly the rap battle between Kid and Play. And I was like, could I do a rapper for the book? And But he's not going to be a good rapper. And Justin <laughs> was like, yes, go for it. Oh, that's great. So was, was yours the only character that got added at a writer's request? Do you know? I don't know for sure. I don't think so because I feel like, and I, I don't know at what point in the development Justin reached out to me because it could have been fairly early, but I feel like the original list I saw wasn't the same count as what we eventually got in the book. So I'm thinking maybe something else was added along the way. Well, your Oscar character is definitely um, someone critical who learns a very, very important lesson from his friends, like, focus on what you're good at, man, you know, just, and there's, there's, I mean, how many millions of wannabe rappers are there out there and who is gonna, you know, get a contract and succeed and, you know, it's kind of good to have a goal that's within reach, something different, but he could still do it at home and like bug his family and bug his friends as opposed to doing it for a career, but I thought, the other arc that was interesting was that this is seniors' last time to get together, and then they are all going to splinter into college and whatever they all do afterwards. So, you know, there was um, a really warm air of nostalgia about it. Like, don't we all love each other? And it wasn't just all from drinking. It was really from recognizing how important that time is. I thought that was really well done. Yeah, I mean, I think Justin did a great job of weaving it all together. I mean, it's just fun to have a sort of light, funny book. Um, I seem, I think that was like the overarching theme of my work that published this year. Well, uh, 
I don't know, you know, light, light, funny, yeah, I guess, but now we get to static. So I know you are really into superheroes, um, comics. So static, from what I've been reading is about what you've posted, it's like, it's kind of like a, a dream come true for you, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, I remember when Static first debuted in 1993, I was 14. Um, I was buying comic books every week, I still do that. And he was one of the characters that really blew me away because he came out of Milestone Media, which was created by black creators. Um, he was among the batch of superheroes they developed that year. And those heroes have lingered, become part of DC Comics and being able to come and play in that sandbox was absolutely a dream come true. I've been talking to DC Comics for probably over a year and a half about potentially doing something with them before we landed on me being able to do static. And like I said, dream come true. So can you give us a little more history about, about static, the character and, and the group that he's part of superheroes that he's part of? Sure. So. The world that Static is largely a part of is known as the Dakota-verse because the city they're in is Dakota. So you think about it the way you would think about Superman and Metropolis. Static is one of a batch of heroes and villains known as Bang Babies. They got their powers originally in the midst of a gang fight. They were gassed by nefarious people thinking the gas might kill everybody when instead it gave some people superpowers. The origin has been um, changed a bit in modern times where this is happening at essentially a Black Lives Matter rally. And when the cops gas people, that gas kills some people, gives some people powers. Static, his real name is Virgil Hawkins, gets electromagnetic powers. He's able to do all sorts of things with electricity, magnetism, um, up to including flying, shocking enemies, um, healing himself. He can use electromagnetism to heal himself when he's injured. Um, he's a fairly strong character and maybe somewhat of an analog for a Peter Parker or Miles Morales if you're thinking about Marvel's characters. Um, wisecracking, intelligent team who can't not help. So um, did you have to do a lot of science to, to be able to fully represent his powers? Not so much. There's a scene specifically in the book where he's doing some legitimate math to figure out how to solve a problem. But for the most part, I got, I've read Static for 30 years. I've watched this TV show. I know how his power sets work. So I didn't have to do too much research to have fun with him. So he has a TV show too? Um, from 2000 to 2004, there was an animated TV show called Static Shop where he was the star. It's currently streaming on Max. So if anyone wants to watch any of those old episodes, they're all there. Oh, that's great. So because you were so familiar with him to, um, to inv did you, so you, the illustrations are gorgeous. And did you two work together to invent the story or how did you come up with the storyline or was it given to you or how did that all work? Now the storyline was all me. Um, when I was asked to write this graphic novel, which is, for young readers. It's, it's considered a young adult graphic novel, the first that Static's ever been in. This is sort of different than writing a monthly comic because Static also has a monthly book that comes out. And the direction I was given was, don't do what they're doing in the monthly books. We don't need you to be like, save the city, save the world, save the universe. Um, we want this to be a way to introduce this character in school libraries to students who may not go to a comic book shop every day. So I developed a story that's essentially an absurdist teen comedy. It's sort of the same framework as movies like House Party, um, Adventures in Babysitting, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where it's a teen comedy set over the course of a very short period, in this case, one night. And it's, it's funny. It, it's a funny adventure about Virgil being dumped by his girlfriend and having to sort of deal with that as he goes on these misadventures all through one night. He has um, a very strong group of friends, too, and some uh, pretty strong enemies as well. Um, I just, like, when did, or, so you said that this is for people who don't necessarily go to comics, to buy comics every week. What's, what's the main difference, other than length, between co a comic and a graphic novel? 
honestly, these days, I think that's the only difference. Um, and sometimes what, you, what you'll see as a graphic novel is just a collection of, say, five or six comic book issues in one book. So I think length is the main thing. Uh, monthly comic book is going to be about 22 pages with a clear break at the end. It's sort of not necessarily a cliffhanger, but it's something they, they put in to make you want to come back the next month. Whereas, for instance, my graphic novel doesn't have those pay breaks every 22 pages. It's more constructed like a movie to have certain act breaks, but they wouldn't fall into 22 page segments neat neatly. So um, do you read generally read both graphic novels and comics? Honestly, I read the monthly books more just because they come out every week and I'm always buying new books. And if I'm reading graphic novels, like some, some graphic novels are constructed as a regular novel would be, meaning that it was always meant to be very long and not those collections. And so occasionally I'll come across those. Like I think one I read in grad school was famous one. I think it's called, I might be messing up the title. I think it's called Fun House. But like there are graphic novels that are written to be lengthy and not have the breaks like I discussed. But for the most part, I do read the monthly books. Do you think, how much of an influence do you think anime and manga have had on American graphic novels? So I'm not sure I'm really qualified to answer this question. And, and young readers I've met in schools across the country get on me about this all the time because I, I'm not very well versed in anime or manga. And so I'm always looking for recommendations. But from what I understand, I'm not clear how it necessarily influences American comics. I just know they're extremely popular among the youth, and that's a style that they gravitate towards in addition to American comics. So I can't say how one relates to the other. I just know I need to study more in terms of the manga and anime <laughs> so I don't get roasted when I go to these schools. Well, I had never um, read any, and then I was um, assisting a student in reading, and he was bored with what we were reading, and he said, and I was getting books out of the library, and he said, can't you get me my, I think it was called My Hero Academia? Academia, yeah. And I'm like, what? So I, and my library luckily had it. And we were reading it together and he was just zooming through it. And I had a hard time because the print is really small. And conceptually, I, we were coming, and we came in in the middle of the series, so I wasn't getting what was going on. But he just blazed through it, and he probably had a copy at home, so maybe I wasn't really helping him with his reading skills, but he certainly enjoyed it. And I was just, I never knew anything about this. So I'm like, yeah, you, I've I got to learn more about it too. I've gotten that recommendation, My Hero Academia. I've been told um, Attack on Titan is one I should check out. Uh, I think that's a manga and the anime. Um, one Punch Man, I think that's streaming on Netflix maybe. So I have a list of things I'm supposed to catch up on. As time allows, I hope to get to them. Okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm so happy for you that you really got to work on a series you've been following f so long and, uh, ha and really have a lot of fun with it. Do you think it, it was, this was funnier than the comic version is? Because you said it was a lot of, this was deliberately had a lot of humor in it. What are the, was that a different path than the regular comics take? I think so. I mean, in the monthly books, Virgil's typically dealing with more serious stakes. Um, there's been like a, a human trafficking arc in the monthly books. And so, and not to say that those books don't have humor, but I purposely steered away from topics that heavy just because my mandate was to do something different. And I thought it would be neat to see how these teenage superheroes sort of react on a off night when there's not a dire threat. Yeah, that's, that's always true. interesting to me. Who you even know? thinks um, about like what Superman and Batman do on their day off, right? Yeah, there's like there's a really cool issue of Batman where Bruce, Selena Kyle, Catwoman go on a double date with Superman and Lois. <laughs> and, and and it's it's to a carnival. And that's one of my favorite issues because you don't often see that sort of interaction between these characters. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, you, you're not fighting super villains and, and cosmic threats 24 seven. I wanna know what it's like when the Justice League has to make a Costco run or something to that effect. <laughs> so this really is almost like a double dream. It's like a character you love in a situation that you don't get to see him in very often. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised. I honestly didn't know 
if the people who make the decisions to green light things would be into it. But they took that pitch as is. I mean, very minimal notes. And so I was excited. I mean, I guess other people like to see things like that, too. Which is which is good to know. And now we're running out of time. So I have um, a picture I'm going to show. I don't know how this will come up, but um, here is your novel, the last one we talked about, The Getaway. And here is you with someone who is now associated with The Getaway. And this is Don Cheadle. And when I saw this, that, my heart went like, ah. So how did that come about? And fingers crossed, what's going on with um, The Getaway being now being partially in Don Cheadle's hands? Yeah, so I mean, it came about because when The Getaway was first announced as a book that was coming out, I guess the pitch was attractive enough where a whole bunch of Hollywood producers and studios wanted to talk about possibilities. And so I ended up having a chat with like 10 different major producers who were interested in taking The Getaway and either turning it into a TV show or a film. And, you know, this is it's, this has been the first time it's been that much interest in something I've done. And so I had the privilege of being able to decide who I wanted to work with among that batch and meeting with Mr. Cheadle's This Radical Act production company, um, the people there, they really seemed to get the book in a way that felt very comfortable to me. The stuff they were envisioning in terms of trying to translate it from text to film resonated. And so it was an easy decision to go with Mr. Cheadle's company. And it's, you know, we made that decision um, but you know, there's been a lot of turmoil in Hollywood over this year between that writer strike and the actor strike. So to be in solidarity with all of them as they try to negotiate their situation, um, it's pretty much been on pause. But since both strikes are over now, we're trying to get some momentum back and see if we can make the TV show happen. I, what I'm curious about, uh, because the book is so obviously a takeoff on Disney and Disney World and their properties. Um, it'll be, it, was Disney one of the bidders <laughs> that wanted to take on the book? You said Disney World. I, I didn't say that. Everybody know I didn't say that. I didn't say anything about that company. <laughs> but, but, so I mean, if you see that similarity there, I mean, hey, that's good. No, all jokes That's aside, just because I'm so smart that I can see yeah, it. Yeah, 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 I, I didn't say that, but. <laughs> To answer your question, no. <laughs> they were not one of the people interested. Okay, that would have been really interesting. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. we're very almost out of time. So tell us what's coming out in 2024, and I'll have you back on the show, of course. Um, in 2024, I have another young adult horror novel coming out called Ruin Road. That'll be out next fall. And it's about a young man named Cade Webster, who's a star football player, likely to go to the pros. But he's also very big. And being a black boy, that means whenever he goes somewhere off the football field, people are afraid of him. Um, he ends up stumbling into a very strange pawn shop one night where he ends up purchasing a wish. He wishes that people would stop acting so scared around him, and it comes true. The problem is the people he encounters from that point forth stop fearing everything. And without fear, a lot of people start to act violently. Um, uh -huh. And it snowballs into some dire consequences. Oh, That's wow. my, yeah. Yeah, that, so sounds, be... that sounds very, very intriguing. Pawn shops are such creepy places. I'm surprised that um, there was a, a really a weird Rod Steiger movie a million years ago called The Pawn Broker that was very controversial. But mm -hmm. what a, a great place to choose for a setting. Because to me, who's, I mean, I guess now that they had that show Pawn Stars, it's, mm -hmm. it's not as mysterious, but I still envision a pawn shop as like this dark little place with the three balls hanging outside and a creepy old man at the counter, you know? So had you always been intrigued by pawn shops? Well, yeah, the, the novel is actually something of a remix and expansion of a short story I published back in 2006 called Wilson's Pawn and Loan, which is sort of a two-hander about a young pawn shop um, owner having a duel of wits with a demon. And he doesn't know what they're really fighting for into the last line of the story. Um, this was published in Brandon Massey's Voices from the Other Side anthology in 2006. Um, it's one of my favorite short stories I've written. And I've always sort of wanted to go back to that particular shop and see what else could be told about. It. So this is my opportunity to do that. 
Wow, that's really gratifying to be able to build on an older work that you really like. I wish we had more time to talk about the anthologies because you've been in many, and even especially a Star Wars one, but I'll show uh, pictures of those at the end of the episode because now we have to say goodbye until uh, late 2024. Lamar, thanks again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, Bookstew viewers and listeners, you certainly have a wealth of Lamar Giles' works to choose from. And keep an eye open for the anthologies that I will uh, post uh, video, uh, graphics of at the end. And I hope you have a very happy holidays and happy new year.